So good morning or good afternoon, everyone. And I'm really excited today um, for this uh, interview uh, with Matthew Wood that is joining us. And um, we have had many interviews before with different people, but I have to say that uh, one of the book Matthew uh, published, I think one of his first book uh, called Seven Herbs Plant as Teachers, um, I was telling Matthew earlier that it really uh, kind of brought my whole idea about herbalism and working with plants, uh, completely brought it upside down and yeah. completely changed my perspective on how to forage plants, how to use them as medicine, how really to ask, uh, I guess, the land and the plants what I need for, for my health, uh, for the clients that we work with, and uh, yeah, completely changed this from uh, kind of, I guess, a more Western way of looking at plants that have certain components and mm. that treat certain illness to more looking at plants. Okay, this is a relationship. And what do you want to heal for me? What do you want to teach me? Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to read Matthew's bio, but you know, many of you probably know him. And if you don't, you are missing out. So I'm going to read his, his bio from his website. So Matthew is a real live herbalist. And I'm maybe ask you about that. What does that mean, Matthew? Uh, he has been practicing herbalist, uh, practicing herbalist since 1982. Uh, so that's almost 40 years. Uh, in a period when many authors and lecturers are merely armchair herbalists, uh, who offer theories and opinions based on book learning, and uh, pharmacopoeia learning, I guess, and other have turned to the exotic tradition of India or China, and he has been an active practitioner of traditional Western herbalism. He has helped tens of thousands of clients over the years with many difficult health problems, uh, while Matthew believes in the virtue of many other healing modalities. He has always been inspired to learn, preserve, and practice the tradition of herbal medicine descending to us from our European, Anglo-American and Native American heritage. He's a member of the American Herbalist Guild, a uh, registered herbalist and has earned his Master of Science degree from the Scottish School of Herbal Medicine accredited by the University of Wales. And Matthew has lectured in all part of the US from Georgia to Maine, New York to California and Santa Fe to Sperryville, Virginia. He has also taught in Canada, Scotland, England, France and Australia. And he's known throughout the world as an excellent teacher of herbal medicine. He's also the author of six acclaimed books on herbal medicine published by North Atlantic Books in Berkeley, California. And we'll be putting all those links and the books references and links if you want to get Matthew's book uh, below our podcast or this video on our YouTube channel. Uh, and yeah, so welcome Matthew and thank you for taking the time. I know you're on travel right now with your family. And so thank you for being here uh, with me today. Yes, thank you. Yeah, um, I thought my um, introduction there, that was better suited to me a while ago when there weren't as many practicing herbalists. There are more nowadays, but back in those early days in the 80s and 90s, it was kind of, uh, there weren't too many real live herbalists in in the North America. Um, and uh, so, um, but there are a lot more now, so that's good. So I want to it, admit that so uh, I guess you and others have done a good job to <laughs> to kind of invite people back onto the land and back into that I guess yeah. I don't want to call it even a practice but a way of life I guess of yeah. you know reconnecting to lands and plants and trees yeah I do feel like um, herbalism is actually part a major important I don't know what um, movement in the movement into the new world the new consciousness um it just seems like it it connects us to nature more closely than almost any other activity it may be farming or animal husbandry would be um up there as well or just living off the land certainly <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah so i want to dive in with one first question that i had you know when i was reading obviously i know a little bit where you are i guess now but we're going to talk more about that but 40 years ago, 
So this is date 1982. So so what happened? What happened at the beginning that really, I don't know, what did you study at the beginning and what really called you into that world of plants medicine? Well, I'm really glad you asked because so I was raised a Quaker and when I was about 10 or 11, we went to Northern Half Yearly Meeting, which was the yearly meeting getting together half yearly, getting together the Quakers up there. We're, there were only a couple hundred of us. And we went by train, which was rare and which is almost unknown there now. But um, so we arrived and it, uh, our Sunday school teacher, our first day school, we would call it, took us up on on Rib Mountain, it's called, which is like about the only mountain in Wisconsin. And and he was hopping from stone to stone. It was a beautiful, it was a sunny day. He was so full of joy. Francis Hall was his name. He was a soil science professor at the uh, University of Madison, was uh, University of Wisconsin Madison. And just this feeling came out of him: nature is alive, nature is alive, nature is alive. And I I knew it was a real thing. I would say that was the first kind of um, psychic transmission transmediumship thing I ever experienced um, consciously, at least since maybe young childhood. And, um, and I, I knew it was true. And I knew, I knew that all the whole world was alive, all the beings, all the plants, animals, humans, of course, um, minerals, I would even say, um, now I would say that I, I didn't, maybe wasn't aware of that then. And um, that we were all, we are all related as the Native Americans say, and, and um, it, it, it felt wonderful. Um, and, I, and I also knew I had to believe it right then and there. I had to believe it or I would never know a spiritual truth again because it was a spiritual truth. I mean, it, to me, this in my older age, well, in my 30s, 40s, 50s, looking back on it, 60s now, um, I see that it was um, a... Let's see, a little music in the background. I'm going to close the door here. Yeah, so I I knew that it was it was kind of like the soul realm. In the soul world, we are all related. And then beyond that, I think now I realize believing in that was a spiritual um, necessity. If I didn't believe that, I just would never get a spiritual truth again. And and um, so. Uh, you know, but I, and I did, one thing I did see was that if I hurt anyone, I would be hurt back. Like we were all related like that. It was all big mm -hmm. circle. Even at age 10 and 11, I did see that then. Um, but over the years, I gained more and more. I studied it and I learned a lot of things. And um, so that was valuable. Then at age 31, I had the opportunity to visit Francis and he was retired now. He, his wife got sick and he stopped going to the Northern half yearly and I didn't see him for another 20 years. And so then I, I was driving through Madison and I stopped at his house and I, uh, I had set up in advance and I said, you know, and I told him how that had inspired me so profoundly. And he didn't really want to, um, uh, he didn't want to uh, be the center of attention. So he said, ah, oh, yes, that was a beautiful day. And I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> <laughs> We were on the same memory pad. And um, so, and I said, uh, I how meaningful it was to me my whole life was based on that, that I truly, my most deep um, um, desire was to teach nature wisdom, I'd call it, or the living nature. Um, and then beyond that, then, and herbalism was a platform for that. So I do see that, although I love herbalism, and um, so I, one is more deeper than the other. I mean, you can't just go out and tell everybody, yeah, nature is alive, you know? Yeah, 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 you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, uh, well, you can tell them that, but they won't believe it all the time. <laughs> you have a podcast, you can tell them that all the time. <laughs> yes, yes. So I guess that was like, it seems like there was like a, a leap of faith at the beginning. You know what? I'm going to believe into that. Oh, there was a deep knowing maybe that just wanted to arise there. Uh, yeah. It feels pretty, I don't know, from what you're sharing is there, no? Yeah. Yeah. And strangely, Francis said, uh, oh, you have chosen well, 
people crave that connection to the living nature, but they can't get it. So you will always be in demand. And I was, my head was spinning like, well, only a Quaker elder would tell you that it's a good choice. <laughs> so, yeah. So I guess it's proven true because, you know, um, in the past 10 years, at least, you know, 20 years, definitely herbalism has, has grown a lot and there's been more teachers out there, more schools. Uh, right. I guess even this pandemic, uh, you know, people have been really turning back towards nature and towards natural remedies and just turning back to the land in general, because kind of being forced to be on the land, you know, you can already go to the office anymore. You have to maybe leave the city, uh, you know, I have the chance to live on a beautiful land here and in nature. So for me, my lifestyle didn't change much, but I know many of my friends in the city. Uh, mm -hmm. felt like oh can i come upstate can i can i come can i find a home somewhere can i live on the land yeah. uh and people are realizing what they've been missing and yeah. maybe in the way you say well it's alive we know about it but we don't really understand until we start to have a relationship here yeah yeah very definitely a relationship with the land yeah so is there one being one plant out there that was your first relationship your first date your first uh, encounter oh, here <laughs> yes um excellent question and again this is mentors um so it would only be about 10 years later um i was in a field botany class age 18 or 19 and old professor lawrence he was a, a professor emeritus and he only taught um, in botany, and he only taught um, kind of non uh, specialist classes that were not required because he was retired and um, this university is kind of strict about it. So he taught one of his, he taught seminar, ethnobotany seminar on hallucinogenic plants, which we all loved. All, all of. <laughs> Everybody wanted to take that class, I believe, at that age. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and then I took field botany with him and we, we had to pick a tree that we wanted to, or plant, we wanted to do a report on. Mine was the bur oak. I still love the bur oak, but any oak I would love. And um, so I did that. And uh, at the end of the, uh, so I gave an oral presentation. I wasn't very good with speech. I can go into that. That's an interesting lesson too. But he said, well, you weren't, it wasn't a very good oral presentation, but um, you really know that plant. You really know the essence of the plant, he said in some way. And I was like, wow, he really gets what I'm going for, the essence of the plant. And that impressed me and um, uh, it made me feel understood. Um, so that was good. And, you know, in college, I just felt like I learned hardly anything until I went to that master's degree program in uh, Scotland, but in herbalism. But uh, yeah, it, I remember, and one of the other professors who had taken over a, a, a ethnobotany class he taught that he'd founded the guy said yes and so they thought the doctrine of signatures they thought the the walnut in the shell looked like a brain inside the skull so they thought it was for the brain oh 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 oh, and I, oh my god i learned something in college <laughs> so, so dr lawrence's classes and that one experience were about the limit of my uh, learning about the living nature i think and <laughs> so that was the first plant or the first tree really that started speaking to you in some ways did you yeah. feel there was already something unexpected there in terms of teaching something that you didn't see in any books something that really came out of nowhere somehow uh because it's what i felt in your seven herbs plant as teachers you know and i want to talk a little bit about the easter lily because that's kind of the the first chapter there but the way you talk about it is very unconventional compared to if you open a no more herbalist book and look at Easter Lily, for example, and what they say it can do, but it's it's more of a myth or a story or a dream there. And there's something much deeper in the way you talk about it. Yeah, I would say that that plant um, did communicate. The oak, I just love so much. It's hard to tell um, that it, whether, I mean, when your conscious mind is real engaged, it's hard to tell, but mm -hmm. in the so other times things move in and I just don't see how I would have learned about, oh, I remember uh, some, yeah, the Easter lily was just kind of speaking to me. I was at the supermarket. There was some for sale. I bought one. 
you know, it was like, wow, this is really, it's so, it, it's like drippingly sexual in that purity, you know, and the European one is known as Madonna lily. The, the Chinese one is Easter lily. We don't have a white lily native to North America, although we do have the tiger lily, various um, wood lily, various lilies that really, mm -hmm. they're white, northern hemisphere at least, yeah. Yeah, and so I, and as I learned, and this has happened to me again and again, I learned one thing and it just would notch together with something else and go on and on. And, you know, I had figured out and used already, used it for, for cysts, for um, ovarian cysts. And um, uh, in the early case, actually, before yeah, it appeared in my book, I think I, uh, a young man had a, um, just a, just a soft movable cyst up here and that helped him. And then I was 30, it was 30 years. Yeah. Before I saw that again and in, in another man, and I don't know, it was in the same place, but <laughs> <laughs> these things. And then Nicholas Culpepper, the great uh, English herbalist who kind of got our whole profession going, he said for Madonna Lily is for swellings in the privities. Well, whatever that means. <laughs> <laughs> It does fit, you know, ovarian cysts, and it is a good uh, menstrual remedy, and it's good fertility. Uh, just to, it helps get rid of mucus out of the that's clogging things up in the womb, or um, along the uh, in the ovaries, making for the ovarian cyst because the egg gets caught there, and mm. the mucus it gets gummed up, and um, it is used in Chinese medicine. Oh, that was another thing. So these things would come together. And um, Chinese medicine is used for stagnant mucus, which is a way to describe a swollen gland, which is pretty close to a cyst, a soft movable tumor. They said it was good for soft movable tumors. They didn't give much detail, but also mucus stuck in the lung. So everything fit together. And even, um, you know, kind of sexuality versus pur purity, even in the description by the ancient Chinese herbalist 2000, not 200, well, 1800 years ago, he kind of describes this kind of personality that's caught between two opposites and kind of not in great depth, but pretty well, actually. Uh, I didn't get that in the book. That was later. But so, yeah, so that's kind of how those herbs started to fall into place. And I do have to say, they really did fall into place, the whole seven herbs with those seven stories. And the seven stories I'd known in Genesis, well, and I did have a good book that really gave the spiritual qualities of those stories, which I'd only ever run across one book like that. And I, um, I, I actually took Hebrew in order to understand the book of Genesis. <laughs> mm, I was wondering, because I was like, in that book, you seem to know pretty well the Old Testament and the ancient scriptures. Uh, and I, I really re love that about the way you weave the stories and, and the plants. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and um, the yeah, I did enjoy um, I the, the Hebrew. It is really fun. It's such a well, uh, it's very alien tongue to us in the West. Um, we're very. I I realized. Wow, we're Greeks. I mean, all of us almost. We're we're so Greek. Uh, just this kind of <laughs> I don't know how to put it, but this kind of informal kind of you know, uh, it's so different from um, Middle Eastern Semitic languages, which are really serious, you know, and um, very, you know, this sharp edged kind of, but at any rate, so that taught me about culture as well, too. So, and, uh, and I wanted to speak about learning to speak, I needed to learn astrology, really, to have a language of energy patterns, energy types. So oak to me was the ultimate Saturnian plant. And I kind of learned, oh, this is Saturn, I see, I just barely knew anything about astrology, but that fit together. So, yeah. So you, yeah, you were tapping into the, the matrix, uh, I guess, the, the web of life that connects to pretty much everything, and you could go any direction there um that's you know in what you were sharing about oh i met that plant and then that other plants you know gave me another one and it's kind of weaved you know it's like this literally yeah. weaving plants yeah. to plant that's very you know when you were speaking about it that reminds me of the dieta the the practice of dieting a plant in south america where you go to a teacher uh basically a doctor of herbal medicine where 
they will find that plants that best for whatever is going on in your life. But then you will, you know, diet that plant with basically, you know, eating that plant or drinking teas or sleeping with it under your pillow or having a little piece of it in your pocket, uh, praying yeah. with it. So really building that relationship in many ways than just drinking it or eating it. And then they say that after a month or a certain amount of time, when that plant is done, another plant is going to show up and it's going to show up directly to you, maybe in your dreams, or maybe it's going to catch your attention as you walk into the forest. And that will be your next teacher. And yeah. here you go weaving teachers, you know, and I've experienced that in my life where um, oh. dandelion was, was kind of my first plant. And then he brought me to, you know, nettle and then nettle brought me to another plant. And they were already, uh, I mean, there was this leap of faith for me because it was really hard to just trust what I was hearing. And I wanted to research, making sure it was non-toxic. I mean, you know, I knew dandelion was safe on it or was safe. But when it come to other plant, I was not 100% sure. But I was always amazed when I was reading about this plant, how uh, accurate it is or it was for what I needed at the time. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because, you know, I mean, I guess we don't really know 100% how it's working or why it's working that way. But can you just talk a little bit about that aspect? Because that's really what you call shamanic, shamanic herbalism. And it's, that's what I wanted to talk about it today. And how that weave yeah. into you know, the spirit and the physicality of the plant. Yeah, let's see. So, um, yeah, I, I would say probably we've gotten kind of typecast fixed um, in our ways in Western herbalism where we use tinctures or teas, whereas originally, yes, you could use all those different methods. And that is very true in South America. And um, But we have a lot in common if we're following kind of the folk tradition and the shamanic approach, which is the doctrine of signatures, the plant looks like what it's for. And that is so true. Or things about it, how it grows, where it grows, colors, et cetera, give us hints about what it's for. And that was actually um, one of my, well, that was a, probably my first tool because the oak was so Saturnian. I understood what Saturn, serious, cautious concern, like saving up all its energy and sending its roots out. The roots are deep and go down to the water table, but you know, deep, and that's why the, the oak survive in California and stuff. Yeah. Or in on the plains of Minnesota or, or uh, Oklahoma or wherever. Yeah, so doctrine of signature is very important, but then that attunement, and yeah, you tend to doubt yourself, but I, I mean, person after person has found what you do, that when you start researching it out, it's like, wow, oh, that is what, uh, that was right. <laughs> <laughs> I have a hard time to believe when I was reading it. I was even more surprised <laughs> when I read yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah, so that attunement level is um, one thing. Dreaming, yeah, so in shamanism, we favor dreaming as much as we can. And I have dreamed about a few herbs. Um, I haven't dreamed about, uh, well, not consciously dreamed about what I should give a person, but sometimes I'll go to bed, wake up, and I do know, you know, something happened and did tip me off. But um, so, uh yeah. Um, oh, I do. I, so, so because I kind of, you know, our Western tradition is kind of um, um, stuck, uh, kind of, uh, you know, doctor-like. Um, and so we, we would have, um, uh, I take the case history and while I'm taking the case history, a bunch of things are coming to my mind. And then a bunch of things may be popping into my mind. Well, not a bunch, but three or four herbs like, oh, why did that pop into my mind? That doesn't make so much sense. And I do believe that as we get better educated as herbalists that, you know, it is our psychic premonition, our knowledge, our shamanism within that is telling us the herbs. But when our conscious mind is really well educated, we don't notice that part of ourselves. Um, mm. Occasionally, it just will be so strong right at the start, it's like both sides agree. I get that one. Um, <laughs> you don't believe it until, I, I always test it. This is a valuable thing to know. Um, I, I take the pulse, but you don't need to be a pulse expert, just find the pulse maybe. And you can put the remedy on or have them hold it in the hand or have them hold a piece of paper even with it written on it and they will react. The people react first, like occasionally people react 
when you think the remedy, if you're taking the pulse, you may not be, but you're taking the pulse and it's like, I thought that remedy and the pulse changed. Next is when you open the bottle and the pulse will change. But usually most people, it's you put it on, I put it on, it's a tincture or I have them hold the herb, uh, dry herb, and then the pulse changes. And a very occasionally a person will change about a minute later. Um, and then if it doesn't change, I really am skeptical that it's the right herb. So I'm just giving you all a kind of a hands-on almost literally. Um, and I have a, a few of my students, they'd be sitting in the back of the room while I'm teaching this and they're feeling like this. <laughs> would be like this. And, and those two um, students of mine from long ago, they're, they're both practitioners. So they are really good at it. They can really do that. So... So you are more a wizard than an herbalist, if I understand correctly here. Well, I am not a muggle. <laughs> <laughs> it might scare some people to come to your class. Maybe if you change that name or if you call yourself that way, or they might have different expectation, I guess. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Yeah. So there is this, you know, kind of feeling that I have with these plants when I learn that way, which kind of goes a little bit about what you were saying, that if I learn too much from the books, yeah. if I read too much about plants, I feel I get either confused or I don't remember everything or even potentially I'm kind of going to disconnect that other side of my brain or that other part of my body that is capable of feeling what's right for me because i feel the plant are kind of conspiring to to get to me like they, they really come i was going into my race bed this morning and doing some weeding and you know there was this plant that i've i'm not sure i've seen before but there was a lot of them on the, and then i was like oh today i need to go research about it because i know if that plant somehow is popping up and it was in multiple beds in places yeah. where usually i don't see that plant and i was like oh I'm pretty sure there is something there. So we see the part of me, the scientist, or the part of me that might be afraid, say, well, I need to check. It's not toxic. And I'm not going to get myself on the toilet for three days if I take that. Uh, right. So what's your, what's your, do you have experience with that? Or do you feel like overall, I mean, obviously we know there are some plants that are, you know, potentially really dangerous out there. It's a minimal, it's very few of them, but there is some even here in the Northern Catskills that can kill you, you know, if you if you're not if you're not aware of it. But do you feel like that intuition sense always get it right? And and what's your kind of feeling around that? I guess you go to a country you don't know the plants. You go to Australia, and mm -hmm. and it's all different. How do you go about it? Do you still go through that? Do you, how do you approach the pharmacopoeia of the plants there, for example? Well, by this point in my life, it's like all different things work. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I'm reminded, yeah, because it happened in southern France, and it was so dramatic, like this doesn't happen to me very, very often, but so I had a friend, it would be near, uh, yeah, in, uh, um, well, in center, southern France, and, and we were walking, she said, oh, we can go to the woods here, and, you know, and there was maybe 10 herbs, because things are overgrazed, and, you know, third, fourth generation of trees, and, but we were starting to walk away, and there was a little, um, what's it called, Herb Robert, which is like our wild um, geranium, which would be in the Catskills too. Both those plants would be. And as I was like, well, well, it's talking to me or something. It's like buzzing almost. And yeah, and I actually do believe that's a very shamanic herb. I have not yet totally understood it, but I, I'd be interested in feedback. Maybe in a couple of months, we can, we can, people can write in, but I actually felt it, it kind of intensified healing hands or sensitivity in the hands. And I really did think this is a shamanic herb. So Herb Robert, which is safe, um, I suppose if you ate a massive amount, it's an astringent, you'd pucker yourself a, a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and that's that's more attunement, not, not intuitive. Other times I definitely intuitive, all oh, the pieces fit together. I love it, you know. Oh, that's that grows where in a certain place that makes so much sense. Um, good to see. Um, so, uh, or yeah, I learned about it on my own and then the book and it's, yeah, like the Chinese herbalism and the Nicholas Culpepper and the, so it fits together that way. Um, I, I would say, yeah, get to know your, um, uh, everybody, your, um, poisonous plants. Um, 
like, and even then I'm going to tell a story there here. Um, so in Minnesota, Wisconsin, it would be like water hemlock, mm -hmm. um, poison hemlock, which is introduced and not as common. That's what Socrates was executed with. Poison OV, uh, uh, oak, uh, poison ivy, we don't really have poison uh, I, um, oak, but poison ivy can grow up trees, poison a vine, and it can be tricky. <laughs> um, that, that would be about it for really dangerous because you wouldn't want to eat poison ivy, you know. Um, so those are ones that I'd consider fatal. But so I was, you know, what, who cares? I know them all, you know, and I had botany. But I was up in one county where the maps show this one plant grows only in Minnesota in that one county. It's introduced Achillea tarmica, P-T-A-R-M-I-C-A. -A. Beautiful plant, garden plant sometimes. A type of yarrow. And we tasted it. And all of us in that class was only six, seven people. It was up in northern Minnesota, not as many. I was in my early days, I wasn't as famous. And all of us got numbness in our cheeks. One woman was pregnant, so I didn't like that idea that, you know, um, we don't really want to take a plant. You know, it, it was, oh, it's called sneeze wart. And it's like, this plant is way more po powerful than that name. This is like a central nervous system toxin. And I have never had an experience like that again, but um, that, that clued me nibble things first and be pretty sure and something that's just completely unknown don't be um reckless <laughs> so yeah i guess it's like a relationship get to know a little bit first before you engage in really close encounter <laughs> feels a little bit like that um so shamanic herbalism, so it's this cross, I guess, between shamanism and herbalism, you know, but what, what would you say are the core foundations to, to practice that or to, for people that are interested here that, that wants to kind of start going on that path that makes much more spirituality or intuition, I would say, than just pure pharmacopoeia, you know, or physics or your biology of plants. How do we go about it? Well, everybody's different. And one, one of my early teacher at the herb store in South Minneapolis, he said, quoting German Mao, let a hundred flowers blossom. And that is so true for herbalism. So never feel like I have to do it like so-and-so, um, or that's just training wheels. It may be so-and-so's work works for you for a while, um, but if it, but it will not work for everybody all the time ever. So, um, yeah, so you will, and the more you go along, you will develop your own, this is interesting, the more you go along, you'll develop your own style, everybody, um, but after 15 years, you'll find everybody will all be, um, they'll all be knowing the same things, too. <laughs> it's <laughs> the are very reliable, and it's like, you you know them in a different way um, uh, as, a, as an herbalist, but they, um, but after 15 years, everybody, they all begin to fit together. All the different people um, have pretty much, I, I've seen that again and again and again, and it makes herbalists more tolerant of each other, I would say, <laughs> because an empirical experience-based um, trade and you learn by experience and, um, and everybody kind of gets to the same findings. And I would say there's a, the scientific herbalists are a little less tolerant um, of us crazies, but um, but and, well, maybe we're intolerant of them. I don't know. <laughs> well, I guess if you go on, a, you know, you go on WebMD online, you know, and you read about any plant, basically there's a thousand reasons why not to touch or take that plant. It's kind of scary, I guess, you know, when you just look at that way, you know, it's almost like, I don't know. I don't want to say conspiracy because I don't think it's one. I just think it's just a way of thinking that just almost tells us, well, you should not, well, you should go to a pharmacy and get a medicine that's known. And at least, you know, you're safe there, which is really not true when we think of plant. Uh, mm -hmm. Overall, they are pretty safe. I mean, at the great majority. Yeah. Compared to Western medicine that always has, I guess, complications or potential risk. Do you feel that way? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, 
they just love, especially in America, to um, point out all the possible problems. And I mean, I looked up dandelion and said, not to be taken when you have a gallbladder problem, which isn't a very medical way to say anything. Well, that's exactly when we use it. And it really only very, very slowly um, kind of, um, I don't know the right word for it, but kind of just det not detoxifies, cleans out the gallbladder. And has it, if, it, if it works for a person, it'll be over two, three months uh, to get rid of gallstones and stuff. And I mean, that's pretty low impact and safe. And dandelion root and leaf are, I mean, they just have been eaten time out of mind by, by everyone where they grow. I mean, uh, where, where I lived in um, um, Minnesota, I, I, don't, I live in Wisconsin over the border now, but um, the, the older people, um, generally they'd say, yeah, my parents always ate the uh, dandelion greens in the spring. So it's like people would be 100 now, would be that generation maybe, well, even older, I'm getting pretty old. But <laughs> they, they did eat the dandelions and some of the their kids would eat them too. And, and I mean, that was just, that was part of the spring greens that you ate to get um, to really because you didn't have any fresh food and, and these foods, bitters help you secrete more and get ready for more food. And the bitters were actually intended partly to make you not get sick when you start to eat richer diet. And a friend of mine said, yeah, uh, the old, the spring fever, fever we say, and, and, you know, and everybody can feel that when spring comes, but technically that meant actually that you ate too rich a diet and got sick uh, in the spring because mm. you, and so they would slowly acclimatize with these bitter herbs. And um, yeah, so these were common and, and I mean, and they're still being eaten everywhere. And it's like the audacity of saying, you know, dandelion root, I mean, that's in, I mean, that's in teas. I mean, oh, and some of these things like, oh, uh, pregnant women shouldn't have um, a raspberry leaf. I mean, this is like time out of my Native American teaching very, and I really feel, you know, we want to, honor the elders and honor um, our teachers and um, native plants that this one's found all over the world. But um, I mean, even in Australia, there's, there's um, native um, uh, uh, raspberry leaf, but it is native American use for pregnancy as a tonic, totally safe. It's not an amenagogue. I didn't, I mean, this is superstition for them to say it's not safe. Now, if it really wasn't safe, no, you know, Lipton's these big, companies, they would not be marketing herbal teas. Um, you know, I mean, they market chamomile. And I mean, chamomile really can cause a near anaphylaxis in about one out of a million people, you know. <laughs> um, but they market it because uh, it's so popular. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's so overdone. But people, it's like, oh, golly, oh, but we better be scared. They really want you to be a scared, afraid. That's medicine's way of influencing people. I mean, biomedicine is through fear in particular, I think. Yeah, and I guess we've done a lot of that. We've criminalized nature a lot. Uh, yeah. You know, many, many plants, uh, you know, we take them out. Uh, I was reading an article the other day about the amount of people that, that are killed every year by over-the-counter drugs uh, yeah. from Tylenol, for example. You know, we're talking people every day in this country die from Tylenol, for example, and I didn't you know, know the statistics. And I don't know anybody that, you know, died from dandelions or raspberry leaves or, you know, any of the plants yeah. that we just mentioned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> at least not every day, because I guess it will be you know, known if that would happen. Um, so I just want to kind of open the discussion here uh, because we are really in a time where we're trying to get out of this sick system. Yeah. Agro-industrial war system that's really, we can see people with depression, we can see people with addictions, we can see people with, you know, cancer and many things that this system really has created or it's a byproduct of that lifestyle. And here we have elders, Native American teachers, people like you, you know, that are trying to bring people back into this ancient tradition. Uh, what's your view on that? And what do you think is in the way at the moment still? Where do you think, you know, we should put our efforts to really make every individual in this country their own herbalist, their own, you know, oh, there's dandelion coming. My grandmother always made us a dandelion salad. I remember when I was little 
in yes. spring. There was always a lot of 99. I didn't like it much because, you know, it was very bitter. Yeah. Uh, but in France, you know, we put a lot of olive oil and creme fraiche yeah. and a lot of things in it. So we covered the bitterness by the end. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was in, you know, and, and she was not very educated. She didn't go to school. She'd never read an herbalist book, but it was, you know, in our traditions, it was in our culture. So yeah. what's in the way today and where how do you think you know we are going to get there really to to get people to really start thinking of their health in a very different way than we are thinking about it today uh i would think even you know more prevention than fixing problem and living with the rhythm of nature and all that yeah gee um yeah that's well that actually doing what she did that's a great um idea right there and that good quality olive oil is a really important medicine especially for older people um uh on vascular tissue and stuff uh it has just a mix of polyphenols that's good for all sorts of different things um, um for heat and irritation in the arteries etc okay so the general question though i could i just couldn't i had to rave <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the general question is, yeah, we just have to educate, I think, on the one-to-one -one level. I remember uh, a um, woman who'd taken um, uh, uh, massage school, and then she got her degree and maybe her license, whatever, and she thought, oh, now how am I going to uh, get known out in the world? And she kept on seeing an a image of a grapevine, 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 and she was like, what, what? And then she said, oh, through the grapevine. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I would say this, that um, like you will, as herbalists, as young budding herbalists, all of you guys, um, uh, you will treat the people that are in your community. They will gravitate to you. They will trust you first and family and a few oddballs, but but they're in your community too, I guess. And, uh, and uh, so you, we treat our community and just um, you make yourself available and it is through the grapevine. And that's really the most solid way. And you know, it really is great when we have herbalists who can treat truck drivers and stuff. We don't have that many. Um, oh, and, you, you know, you just have to be, what would I have to say? I hate to say tolerant, to use the word, but you got to be socially open to everybody that comes to you. But really, the people that come will often be people that just you you vibe with, you click with. And that's net natural. Um some of you, um, uh, like yeah, mothers with kids, they usually get a practice going, I find, because the other mothers ask them, you know, or in a school or something like that. Um, but I would say, uh, I, I remember one guy, see, I don't very often have hunters or something for my clientele, but I had a guy who was a hunter and he said, oh yeah, I, I learn, I just look, I watch what the animals eat and I learn and, and nibble on them. And I, I've learned herbalism that way too. And it's like, you know, there's like people that would be hunters you wouldn't think would be very compatible with our kind of shamanic way, but they might be um, not all hunters. I, I really just like the way the hunters over hunted the wolves in uh, Wisconsin here just a couple of weeks ago. It was really a mm -hmm. slut. They really took advantage of the law. Um, but uh, there are good good people in every every area. So uh, so word of mouth, and you know, we did start out with just a few people um, uh, in herbalism. You know, back to a couple dozen people, it seemed like, and then a couple hundred and thousands, and then and then our students, students, and so it has really spread and really been a wonderful movement. But when I was young, I mean, everybody was afraid of the law. We were afraid of being arrested. There was like two or three nationally known herbalists, and they either were arrested or were constantly in danger that way they didn't actually bother the hippies that much like they they arrested dr christopher 35 times but he was a mormon you know that was a little too um muggle for the authorities um i guess was... that changed a bit <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the Mormons actually do love her, partly due to him, but partly other historical. But uh, and then William Massassier, who was in New York City, one of my mentors and friends, died about almost twenty years ago. Um, he was kind of the first of the hippie herbalists, and you know now I see it's like if you talk, if you you don't need okay, also worry about arrest. Don't worry too much nowadays, but always base you know the more energetic you can be this is a hot herb it's a cold condition we need to treat um opposites there uh like treats like works for doctrine of signatures it looks like the heart it's for the heart 
um, uh, or motherwort for nervousness of the heart palpitations, etc. It looks like a beat on going up the stem. Mm -hmm. um, so, and I find the more that you just talk what's natural to us in our wild out of their, you know, non-mogul way, that they, they'll leave you alone. They really just do not care about astrological herbalists or hippie crazy or shamanic herbalists. They don't care. And um, they're most upset by people, they would say, pretending to be scientific. Now I would say, you could be a scientific herbalist. It's not a pretension, mm -hmm. but that's them. Oh, they're using, they're, they're trying to be scientific and, mm -hmm. you know. So, so you um, definitely want to be the wizard. <laughs> that's, that's you and then you become for for us for us too and all, all our listeners it's um it's natural <laughs> yes yeah. okay, i should use the word wizard yes we <laughs> <laughs> a witch or you know whatever whatever attempt to us wizards works, works better yeah yes and um uh philosophers of nature <laughs> yeah so if there was, I don't know, three plants or five oh. plants here in the Northeast, uh, wild plants that I can find very easily that I should really incorporate into my, my diet, what would it be? And, you know, can you tell us a little bit about them? Maybe three of them if it's too long, but what, what should I really take? I mean, we talk about dandelion, I guess that's one of them. Uh, yeah. What other plants maybe you could recommend for people to start connecting to wild foraging and wild medicine? Yeah, I'll think these aren't, uh, well, okay, so yarrow, not so edible, very medicinal, a little too sharp, pungent, and um, bitter tasting, but it stops bleeding that's, you know, it can be catastrophic bleeding. Um, you know, uh, my my cousin, oh, well, he didn't use yarrow, oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just tons and tons of of um stories uh, so many herbalists and this is very universal it's certainly european medicines called it herba herba militaris and north american uh, lakota i can't remember the lakota name Payuta um uh medicine medicine for the wounded mm -hmm. uh, so carpenter's friend um um soldier's wound ward in in english so the and achillea named for achilles so these have a universal um, use for wounds. And the more you're bleeding, the more, the more the blood spurts, the more it works. It doesn't work for oozing, um, fairly coagulated, uh, anything like that. It's really, boom, whoa, I'm missing a piece of skin there. And, um, uh, and, and a deep cut, and you look down the cut, and it's like you can see down the walls of the cut, and, oh, there's no blood in there. I mean, it's amazing that way. And... Um, in addition, it's a great fever remedy. It's one of the top, so elder, yarrow, and maybe peppermint or spearmint, top fever remedies, le uh, le maybe lemon balm too. And um, so you want to have fever remedies. Um, the age old formula is elder, yarrow, and peppermint or spearmint. Um, then I would say uh, Solomon seal, which is 90% of people need, or, or at least, yeah, I think 90%. It's for stretched tendons, ligaments, or too tight. So the tendon was too tight, and then someone stretched it, and then it won't go back in place. Or clicking, they're getting, the tendons are getting tighter and less flexible. Um, then uh, it's because it works on the tendons, ligaments, generally anything that works on any connective tissue will work on another one. So it repairs broken bones. And it uh, is good for cartilage and joints, although I'd add horsetail silica for cartilage. Mm -hmm. It's good for carpal tunnel. I just hate to see people getting operations. It works 90% of the time on carpal tunnel. And there's a few other remedies so that it's almost impossible to fail on carpal tunnel or overuse of any overuse of any joint is in addition to carpal tunnel. Um, and it kind of helps your body parts get in the right place, I would say. So it's a good pelvic remedy. And this is male and female for like kind of legs, not somehow your hip joints. It's got a signature like a hip joint, the Solomon seal, where the stock comes off the root, the rhizome. And so I guess um, even postpartum, postpartum to get the muscle back in place and the tensions in the yeah. pelvis also back in place, things yeah. like that. 
Yeah, I guess I, I'm not sure I would take it during the latter part of pregnancy. Or no, I was would... thinking after birth, you know, when the tissues yeah, have been stretched and you're trying yeah. to strengthen back your, your pelvis, for example. Or... Yeah, and I, I would say fall Solomon seal, mm. which that's its muggle name. It, it, it tells us, it's told so many people it wants to be called dragon root. And I'm like, you're such a shrimpy little plant, little teeny, how could you be dragon root? <laughs> My friend Paula, who is no longer with us, she said, well, it's a little herb with a big attitude. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good, right? Couple of the last week of pregnancy to loosen the um, symphysis pubis and also restorative after. So true and false both get useful. I'm talking about true, though, it's the one that's so useful, so much. Um, and be in the right place at the right time, even it has a kind of a magical use where you just tend not to have as many bad things come up when you're wearing it or uh, using it. Um, so, and it is an old magical remedy and there we touch on uh, Afro-American Southern um, medicine. Um, it's one of the magic herbs down there, but um, it's also old Native American and it's it was not much used in um, Europe because rumor that it was toxic, only the seeds are toxic, but um, then it, it did start to be used in English herbalism, and there is a tradition more in English than in French, Spanish, um, Romance language. Um, uh, and so um, I think it's used in German herbalism a little bit too. But um, yeah, and that grows on hillsides in uh, big river valleys, um, the Hudson, the, the Delaware. Um, and then if you're gonna use this plant, be ecological because you don't wanna exterminate it. We are using the root, so plant it, replant it, plant it in your garden, but it likes a slope, a semi-wooded to open slope. So, yeah, and there's two good herbs. Um, the th third one I'd kind of leave up to, to everybody else, but um, I have to, yeah, I've got to get a third one there that I just feel, well, burdock. Burdock helps you digest fats and oils, uh, process fats and oils. If you're too dried out, not enough oil, or too oily, like a teenager's oily skin. They're too, they got so many oils, their steroids, their hormones are going crazy. It kind of modulates um, steroids, hormones, and mm -hmm. uh, it's a good prostate remedy. And it's probably, and it's a good um, prolapsed womb remedy um, from Culpepper, we learned that, and that's been tried out. And it's a, some kind of hormonal regulator, I, it, not enough is known about it that way. So, so there's three good ones, yes. <laughs> Thank you, that, that's useful. Um, oh, I'm, I'm in, but I'm gonna add one, okay. Yes, and, please. <laughs> Angelica, this is a true shamanicer because mm -hmm. Angelica opens your imagination, your third eye, your theater, inner movie theater, like bing, ah, oh, yeah, just relaxes so nicely and um, the root of the wild or the domesticated um, angelica. And to me, that's like um, kind of opening shot fired across the bow of your um, shamanic path is having that imagination be open. Mm -hmm. And yeah, dream time too. Okay. Oh, I love that. Love it. Yes. Um, so yeah, we're getting close to, to the end of our time together, but I wanted to ask you about your latest book, which uh, I know you just recently published a new book, I believe. Uh, I did send you a manuscript that I haven't published yet, but on my Matthew Wood Institute of Herbalism um, Facebook page, yeah, in our library, I do have for ebook, um, Seven Guideposts on the Spiritual Path, the Shamanic Story in Genesis, which is what I've learned after 30 years or um, 35 years, no, 25, whatever, how many, 35 years since I wrote that first Let's book. say 40, we're almost at 40, yeah. <laughs> 1982. <laughs> yeah. It is really a great book, I because I, I didn't understand a lot of things about shamanism then. I wouldn't have called myself a shamanist, um, but I believe, like, the, to me, basic shamanism is you you learn to know your animal self. And that animal self is connected to paradise, to the spirit world, because, you know, we ate the apple in Eden, so to speak, to use the metaphor, but, but the apple, the animals didn't, um, they ate the apple, it's okay for them. And <laughs> <but> <laughs> their spirit, their tutelary spirit, their totem, their 
their over presiding consciousness has that connection to the spirit. So when you dream of your animal self or it comes to you, you get that connection. And that to me is the basic path of herbal, of, of shamanism. So plants, animals, nature, so, so powerful. And um, yeah, and I'm glad everybody, I'm sure that's listening to this, um, they know how true that is, yeah, or, or are striving to learn more and more, yeah. Yeah, thank you for that. And I'm guessing, you know, obviously we're going to put your website, but uh, you do, you know, remote consultations or, you know, helping people. Also, I know you treat a lot of people and you talk beautifully about that in your Seven Herbs Planless Teachers and some beautiful example. So yeah. can people just reach out to you if they want to, you know, get a consultations or learn from you? I know you have a lot of online programs and, you know, I received your email about it. So yeah. can you tell us a little bit about how people can reach out or, you know, if they want to learn more or get a consultation? Yeah, I, I did kind of consider myself semi-retired. Um, you, you just can't stop treating people, helping people, doctoring people is a better name, the native way of saying it. And um, uh, so I'll never give up, but I did kind of semi-retire now, just fame, you know, having a school, just more and more people calling me. If people want to call me, not until after May 7th, because I'm traveling and it's just, I'm a little overwhelmed and I'm going to get one of my apprentices, I'm going to get her to set consults up for me because I'm, mm -hmm. I'm overwhelmed, but yeah. But if people are in ailments or things like that, it's something that's possible, you know, they can always, you know, at some point get a consultation or if they want to learn on your website, you have a school of herbalism, people can go there and yeah. take your class and learn from you. Yeah. And I would say too, within a year, we'll set up an online clinic so that it'll be I'm not, not completely free, but maybe just 15 to $20 for a consult so students could sit in and learn that way. Um, and so um, I just don't believe in completely giving stuff away for free, but make it almost free. <laughs> so uh, I always charge for the herbs. I'm willing to give my own time away, but I just feel a respect for the herbs. I just cannot stand to give them away, but other people have other traditions. So, yeah. Yeah, so thank you for that. And I think, you know, it's an important point. You mentioned that today, you know, many plants and herbs have been either over harvested or they're losing habitat. They're losing, you know, places to grow. Uh, so really reminding people to be really mindful in the way they collect plants and to do it in a respectful way and to only take what we need and to make sure there is enough uh, for those plants to just uh, grow again and resupply themselves. You know, I think it's very important. Uh, to mention that. Yeah, and I will advertise a class actually, and I don't know if it's free or well, there's a cost on it, but we're I'm doing it. So Susan Leopold, president of United Plant Savers, uh, she and I are doing just a class on this. It's more me interviewing her. I mean, I, I certainly know, I know my way around, you know, ecological wild crafting when I'm in the woods, but, but I, I don't teach it. I don't know, you know, world conditions. Um, and so we're going to have a two hour class on um, pr appropriate wild crafting and use of wild herbs and wild herbs that come in the market that we didn't um, wild craft. And so I highly recommend that. And actually, you may want to interview her, too, um, for for something like that. We're trying to, you know, we're started I, me and my producer, Tara and um, Susan, we kind of thought this up on our own. So I'm doing it first, but I would like many different herb schools and the American Herbalist Guild and everybody to, to do classes with her and just make it widely available um, so that uh, we're not trying to make money or something. We're trying to support the plants this way. So That's wonderful. Yeah, we can definitely set that up. And for the people listening or that are going to watch this video, we are going to do a private screening online of uh, the documentary Seed as the untold story. Uh, which is really an, an amazing documentary on, you know, preserving those old seeds and, you know, trying to keep diversity in our diets uh, because we grow pretty much five different types of food and there is thousands out there, uh, you know, like uh, I always take the example of the potatoes. When I go to Peru, you know, there is uh, thousands of species of potatoes. There's potatoes medicine man where you can go for any elements and they have a different potato. Uh, but here we have, you know, 
the yellow one and the pink one if we are lucky maybe the sweet one and that's it so that's pretty much what we call potatoes but uh, there's so much more to it so yeah we're going to be you know broadcasting that and hopefully for this earth months and earth day uh you are inviting everybody to kind of dive more into that and to look at the diversity of the diet not just the medicinal plant in nature but you know incorporating foraging foods uh, and finding edibles that are available and extremely nourishing for the body way more than anything pretty much cultivated out there even if it's organic or things like that uh, there's all those nutrients we cannot find um, well thank you so much Matthew it was such a pleasure to connect with you today anything else you want to share with us before we we disconnect Let's Any last word of wisdom from the great well, wizard. <laughs> I have to say you are doing the right job because, um, or I should say, they are doing the right job. Um, but um, because uh, you're just uh, the the I got to use the Quaker way because I was raised that way. <laughs> the is using the the the, the uh, you're such a good the, the is such a good uh, um, uh, at asking questions and coming up with good questions. I mean, I, I just felt felt like one after another. Like wow, uh, he really knows what he's doing, you know. So, <laughs> well, so I don't know. I feel I know less and less, and but you know, when I listen to people like you, but I, I'm definitely very curious and very interested, genuinely interested in knowing more. So, uh, yeah. my case questions you are quite pointed because I'm interested in very specific subjects, which hopefully interested people today on the same on the same subject. That was an excellent job. Thank you. So, so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Matthew. And thank you to everyone that's listening either uh, on our podcast today or on the YouTube channel. Uh, I invite you to go and subscribe to our YouTube channel on the Sanctuary Shamanic Healing Center or on our podcast. You can find them pretty much everywhere there is podcast, uh, even on Spotify now. And uh, yeah, if you have uh, any question and interest in, you know, other uh, type of uh, speech or people we could bring, you know, please email us. Uh, and we hope you, you enjoy that. Uh, thank you again, Matthew, for taking time from your, from your family while you're traveling. I know you're really busy, so I really appreciate the time you've given us today. And yeah, uh, it just made me even more excited to go out after this interview and just look at what's growing right now. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Thank Great you time. so much. Bye, I guess. Thank you. Bye.